Good evening and welcome to Prayer School 102. It is my, it is an excitement to me that you would allow me into your space. God bless you. Thank you for joining. Here is Prayer School 102, uh, uh, an expression of the prayer boot camp for all nations. My name is Agatha Ademiju and, and I'm very um privileged to be the one to share the word of God with you today at Prayer School 102. God bless you and thank you for joining. Hallelujah. So that, what I'm going to do right now without um, further ado is I'm going to pray and then we're going to dive straight into today's teaching. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your spirit. Jesus said the spirit of God will teach us all things. He will take of you and of himself and he will teach us. The Holy Spirit will teach us. And tonight, as we gather at the feet of your word, at the under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, Lord, we ask that you would teach us. Show us what you would want us to know at this point in time concerning the subject of prayer so that we will be more and more effective in our prayer life and in our exercise of dominion upon the earth. To you alone be the glory, to you be the praise, that your church will be edified, you alone will be glorified. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. Yes, this is Agatha Ademiju. Welcome to Prayer School 102. Last year, we had a very good uh, experience with Prayer School 101. And this year, God has kindly allowed us to host Prayer School 102. And I want to believe that the things you would learn in this school, in series of classes, you would, be, you would find them extremely useful and pivotal to bringing you into a more effective prayer life. Uh, um, James chapter five, that scripture that we all know, anybody that likes praying knows that scripture in the book of James. It says that the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man availeth much. It makes power available. And that power is what will then make the change that we desire upon the earth. Amen. So thank you very much for joining. Sit back and let's have a good Holy Ghost ride. Like I said, I sent out a post to some people. I said, um, we're going to have a very wonderful Holy Ghost ride today. And I know that your prayer life will never remain the same again. It's just going to go another notch upward. Amen. Praise God. So this evening, um, let me quickly mention the things I said last week. We established the fact that God has sent us to the earth as his own law enforcement agent. In fact, the way it is written in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse um, 19, is that you are an ambassador for Christ. So you are here as a representative of God's embassy or God's kingdom. You are God's representative on the earth. And that is why it becomes important that we know how to connect with, with our kingdom and how to live the life that our kingdom expects of us here on earth. That requires the subject of praying. You know, when you talk about prayer, people always think about, oh, when I have a need, I'll go to God. In fact, you see people who say to you, why are you praying so much? How, how much is your need? How how, how come you have so um how come you are praying so much do you are your needs that much no that's because they don't understand the concept of prayer and last week we looked at it and we said prayer is not about asking god what you need it is a product of your relationship with the lord and the truth is that every human being prays it's just that people pray to different beings every human being prays why because every human being is a spirit being you are praying primarily a spirit. We can't see the real you. The real you is inside the body that we're seeing in the camera. And so the real you has a connection with 
with the spirit world. The, uh, the real you lives in the spirit because it is a spirit. He is a spirit. You are a spirit. Why? Because God is a spirit and he made us in his image and likeness. And so he has given us this tool called prayer so that we can connect our life as physical beings on the earth with our lives as spiritual beings in heavenly, in, in, in spiritual world. And in the spiritual world, we're not the only ones there. Jesus is there. God the Father is there. The angels are there. You are there. Demons are there. There are There is the world of the spirit in which we all live. Every single human being, we have a spirit that lives in the spirit world. Now, the reason why you are able to operate on the earth is because God has graciously sent us to the earth to carry out an assignment for him. So he gave us a body or what you can call an earth suit so that our spirit entity can have a, a, a means or a vehicle in which through which it's able to move around on the earth. That is why when you go to a funeral, people are crying. Why? Not because the body is not in the casket, but because the owner of the body has left the body. And 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 that that's the only way I can, that's one way I can explain to you this whole spirit thing because the last time, Somebody was asking, what do you mean by we live in the spirit and we live in the physical? We live in the spirit because we're spirit beings. That's who we are. That's, that's your primary location. You are spirit beings. But as human beings, we have the privilege of living both in the spirit and in the physical world because we have the physical body. And that was given to us by God so that we can carry out his purposes upon the earth, which he made. Remember that in prayer school 101, uh, um, I wanted to say chapter one, but I meant class one. In the first class, we looked at the fact that God, the origin of prayer is 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 on the is on the premise that you have uh, uh, um, you you have access to the spirit realm. And it is that access, when you exercise that access to the spirit realm, that you are exercising prayer. So remember this, prayer is not just about asking God about your needs, it's about generating a healthy relationship with the Lord. And also on the basis of that healthy relationship, you are then able to speak and, and cause things to happen on the earth. And we looked at last week, we looked at Jesus teaching the, um, his disciples how to pray in Luke chapter 11. He said to them in Luke chapter 11, he says, when you pray, say our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. In other words, prayer is an avenue through which you can communicate the kingdom of God to the earth. So it then becomes important as someone who is a representative of God on the earth, as someone who is, who is speaking for God on the earth, who is dealing for God on the earth, it becomes important for you to know what your kingdom, your headquarters, the kingdom of God, what does this stand for? Does this stand for the things that are going on in the earth? Is it everything that's going on in the earth that the kingdom of God stands for? You and I know that the answer to that is no. There are some things that do they're not representative of God's kingdom. If you read the scriptures well, you find out that God is against sickness and disease. God is against his people being harassed by sickness and disease. Hence, in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, the Bible says God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost and with power so that he went about healing all that were oppressed of the devil. In other words, he placed on Jesus an enablement that, uh, that allowed him, that gave him authority to destroy any sickness or disease. Why? Because the kingdom that Jesus belongs to does not, uh, does not, um, tolerate sickness and disease. And so in the same way, as a representative of God in the earth, you have that authority to exercise the kingdom of God in the earth. And so Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray. He said, this is what prayer is about, an avenue through which God the Father can access the earth because you are the one that has a body. Yeah, last week I did mention that it is not all right to expect that God will just show up in the earth and just do anything. No, he wouldn't. He would do it through us, through human beings. And that is why he, he wants more, more of people like you and me who would 
take sides with him, who will come onto his side so that he can do more of what he loves to do in the earth. And what does God love to do? God loves us. Just He just loves to love us. And so with more of people like you on the earth, we're able to constantly allow God to flow into the earth, his love, his peace, his joy. But because not everybody in the earth is taking sides with God, then that means that the other kinds of spiritual activities are going on in the earth through other kinds of people. And so today, I want us to look at the fact that we are New Testament Christians. And as New Testament Christians, we need to understand what, how, what are the differences between our prayer life and the prayer of somebody who you will say was an Old Testament Christian. For one, the Bible says that this New Testament that we are in is a better testament. Testament means covenant. It's a better covenant. And it is established on better promises. Why is it a better covenant? Because the Old Testament was based on the blood of animals. But the New Testament is based on the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the that is the biggie. You know it, I know it, that you cannot compare the blood of animals to the blood of the spotless Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. I forgot to mention that I'm making assumptions that for you to be in this class, you are you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. You 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 believe that the word of God is final authority, hence you want to learn to pray. Amen. And so the, the discussions here are based on the fact that God has already, um, the, the, it's based on the fact that you that God has sent Jesus Christ and you have accepted him and you are happy to run with the ministry that Jesus has given to us. Amen. So going back, so, so the New Testament believer needs to pray the way Jesus taught. Hallelujah. And Jesus in Luke chapter 11 was teaching people who were not yet in the New Testament. Yeah, you say to me, but Agatha, the book of Luke is in the New Testament. Yes, that's the way it's arranged in your Bible. But the New Testament came into effect after the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, after his blood was shed. If there was no shedding of blood, the Bible says there is no remission of sins. And so the New Testament begins after the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so anything that, that, that you want to, to, to um, do in, in the New Testament, you need to look at how the, the, the death of Jesus affects that thing. So how does the death of our Lord Jesus Christ affect our prayer life? Hallelujah. And the, the, this is such an important question you need to ask yourself when you see all these people praying in funny ways. You need to ask yourself, the death of Jesus Christ, does it bring this onto the table? How, what does the death of the Lord Jesus Christ bring to the table? Because that's going to determine whether you are praying a New Testament prayer. But let's look at what Jesus said about the New Testament prayer, John chapter 16. We mentioned this in, in prayer school 101, and I'm just going to you know recap. John chapter 16, and in verse 23, the Bible says Jesus was speaking. And if you read from verse 1, Jesus had been talking to them about the coming of the Holy Spirit and the fact that he was leaving. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. And so we know that he's talking to people who are going to become New Testament Christians. This, these people were like in between the Old and the New Testament. He, he, he was grooming a group of people who he was going to usher into the New Testament. And this is what he told them in verse 23. 23. He said, and in that day, you shall ask me nothing. He's talking to the, believe, the, the people that will become believers. He says, you will ask me nothing. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. He that will, you ask me nothing in my name, ask and, he shall, and you shall receive that your joy may be full. Hallelujah. Jesus was saying here that up until now, in verse 24, he said, up until now, you haven't had to ask anything in my name. You haven't asked the father anything in my name. But when that time comes, when I have done, finished with my work and I'm gone, you will then ask the father for what you need in my name and the father will do it for you. 
What does that tell us? That the name of Jesus is the most important ingredient in the New Testament prayer. Why? Because they could have asked the Father for things before, but Jesus said, up till now, you have not asked anything in my name. But from now on, you would ask in my name, says Jesus. In other words, the name of the Lord Jesus brings us into connection to the Father. And so when God is looking at the body of Christ, when God is looking at the people that have received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, he's not looking at them as if, oh, they're this weakling, they're this, uh, you know, people say a lot of things about the church, how the church is dying and how the, no, God doesn't see it that way. God sees the, the church that his son died for. And in fact, the Bible says that Jesus is our substitute. So when God is looking at us, he's looking at he, the, the one that he sent, which is Jesus. And that is why God absorbed us into Jesus. If you read John chapter eight, and I think it's verse 32, it says, if I, if you, if, if I be lifted up, I would draw men to me. In other words, he would absorb the whole of humanity into himself through his sacrifice. And so through the sacrifice of Jesus, we have now come into Christ. And now we can access the father, but we can't access him without the name. Amen. So a New Testament prayer is particularly different because it is made in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to God the Father. I know that when I ask people, oh, who do you pray to? Many of them will say, many people will say, I pray to, I pray to, um, People say, I pray to Jesus. But really, you, you the, the New Testament prayer that Jesus has, has taught us here in John chapter 16 is a prayer to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Of course, you will need the help of the Holy Spirit. So I say a New Testament prayer is made to the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the help of the Holy Spirit, because that's the help you get. By the help of the Holy Spirit, you make your prayers to the Father in the name of Jesus. Remember that what happened in the Garden of Eden is that there was a breakdown in relationship between you and the Father. And now Jesus has come to be that bridge that allows you and the Father to be reconnected. So if you try to go to the Father through any other way, there is no chance for you. The you need to go to the Father in the name of Jesus. So Jesus meant it when he said, no man goes to the Father except through me. He meant it because he knew that by his death, you will be able to regain access into whatever the Father has got for us. So a New Testament prayer must be made to the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, Jesus was talking about in your relationship with the Father. Amen. So if I, I want to differentiate that prayer from the one that is in John chapter 14. Jesus said in John chapter 14, um, reading from verse 12. Verily I say unto you, Jesus is talking about the greater works, okay? Verily I say unto you, he that believes on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. Greater things than this shall he do, because I go unto my Father, okay? Because I'm going to the Father, that, that you can do the things that I have done. And you can even do more, Jesus is saying. He says, and in verse 10, he says, whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do that my father may be glorified in the son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Hallelujah. So how do I different? What do I mean by this is a different kind of prayer? Jesus was talking in verse 12 about the greater works. He was talking about the things that he had done. He had healed the sick. He had cast out devils. He had, he had established the kingdom of God on earth. And Jesus is saying, if you would ask for something to be done in the name of Jesus, in his name, that he will make it happen. Hallelujah. Why, why is he not saying, if you will ask the father here? Because when you are dealing with, with when you're exercising your authority for the greater works, you don't need to ask the father. You just exercise those, that authority in the name of the Lord Jesus. And that is why you never read anywhere in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, uh, Acts chapter Acts um, of Apostle uh, and the Epistles. You never read anywhere where Jesus is ministering to the sick and he's asking the Father to, to, give, to, give, um, to bring healing. 
No, because he knows the will of God concerning healing. And so he would basically exercise their authority. He said to me, but then why does he say ask? That's because the word ask, it, it, it means, it also means demand. It also means, uh, um, uh, it means make a request, but it also means to demand for something to be done. So in, in, the, in the prayer in John chapter 4, it's not a prayer towards the Father. It is, it is a prayer that you are making a demand or you are requesting for something to take place. For example, you are requesting for sickness to leave and for healing to be restored. Jesus said you will make that request in his name and it will be done for you. So it is not all right for you to just keep saying, oh God, ah, why aren't you healing me? Please heal me. Please heal me. No, we know that God has already healed you. According to 1 Peter 2, 24, by the stripes of Jesus, you were healed. Isaiah 53, the, um, he, he took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. He, he, he was bruised for our transgression. He was wounded for our transgression, he was bruised for our iniquity. The, the punishment that was required for our peace was laid upon him by his stripes you are healed that is the that is the fact hallelujah those are the new testament facts and that is what makes a big difference between the new testament prayer and the old testament prayer in the old testament they had not experienced the arrival of the redemption and the, the of the redemption of our lord jesus christ the redemptive plan of god was still in his uh, in his uh, gestation period but it, but in the new testament the redemptive plan of god has been hatched has been consummated and now we are praying from victory not for victory we have we have been given the victory through our lord jesus christ and because we have been given that victory anything that tries to to violate that victory we take a stand against it and we say no you cannot come here now that is why it is not a time to say oh lord um please heal lord please um, do this because he has already done it so what we're saying is lord we thank you for the power and the authority in the name of the lord jesus thank you for the plan of redemption thank you in jesus name we come against hallelujah and that is why when we see the disciples in in, in, in the book of acts when the peter and john were going to the temple before prayer started, they met the man by the gate called Beautiful. And the Bible says, Peter said to him, silver and gold have I none, but such as we have, we give to you. Now, the Bible does not tell us that Peter had to have a, a conversation with God before he prayed for that man. Now, that is the difference between the John chapter 14 prayer and John chapter 16 prayer. In John ch chapter 16, it is it is with, with, with regards to your relationship with God. Like I said to us last week, we have a twofold job description. We are now called kings and priests, and that's according to Roman, uh, Revelations chapter 5, verse 10, that Jesus has made us through the things he did. He died, he, he was buried, and he was raised from the dead, sitting at the right hand of God the Father. Through that entire process, Jesus has now made us kings and priests and as a king you rule as a priest you minister or you serve and so our, in, in in our prayer life there is always that balance between ministry to the lord and serving for the lord you know you you are you are a ministry servant towards the, the lord and you are also serving him in exercising rule on his behalf so as a priest, you, 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 you can enjoy the, what we call prayer of communion, you know, like where you, 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 Jesus said, when you pray, say, our father who art in heaven, you know, you, 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 you are spending time just to fellowship with him or even to talk about, uh, oh Lord, I, I just want to bring to you the things that are happening in my family life. I just want to commit it to you. I know that you know everything about everything. I thank you because your plans are good for me. Now that's prayer towards God. Jesus said, you make that prayer to the father and he will do what you are requesting of him. You are requesting that he moves into your circumstances and into your life and, and create opportunities for you and turn it around as a testimony. 
Jesus said he would do it. But if you come up against any walks of darkness, any walk of the enemy, Jesus said, you need to make that demand and command that the situation should change. There is a big difference between the Old Testament believer and the New Testament believer because the Old Testament believer did not have God living on their inside. They did not have the righteousness of God that we now have free of charge. The Old Testament believer was always, was never sure if God was going to come through. If you read from Genesis all the way to to, to uh to Matthew, you will find out that there was little or no knowledge of the activities of the devil in the Old Testament. And so when they pray, they just, that's why we read the psalm. In one breath, he said, oh God, don't kill me. And then in the other breath, he said, oh, how I love you, Lord. Because he, they didn't quite understand in fullness that like we do now, they didn't quite understand that it's not everything that is happening that God is responsible for. Somebody says, but God is in control of all things. We, we heard that last week. God is not in control of everything. God is not in control of the destruction that is going on all over the world. Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, it says, we are of God, but the whole earth lies in wickedness. Another translation says that the whole earth is being swayed in darkness. And so there is darkness upon the earth because there is the devil upon the earth. How do I know? Jesus introduced him to us in John chapter 10 and verse 10. You know that scripture. Jesus said, the thief has come. There is a thief and he has come. And he has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And so there is an activity of the negative spiritual uh, world that is going on while we are here on earth. So you can't just pray, just any kind of prayer and expect that, oh, that means that God will understand. Yes, God will understand, but the devil doesn't. And the devil will try to prey on your ignorance. It will try to take advantage of you. Amen. I want to be able to answer a few questions that I'm, I, I got, I've got here. Um, I've actually answered one of them. It says, can you give an example of a prayer not prayed correctly? Things like, uh, Lord, heal my friend of that sickness if it is your will. That is, that is a wrong prayer. And this is prayer school, so I can tell you straight. That is a wrong prayer. It, it, it is the will of God to heal anybody. Why? Because he sent Jesus to destroy sickness. So he cannot tolerate what he sent his own son to destroy. He can't tolerate it. And that is why when you come, when, when you go to a hospital and you're going to, or you go to visit a friend who's not feeling well, or you're praying for your child, or you're praying for a friend, you don't say, Lord, heal him if it be thy will. Why? Because it is the will of God. What happens if you pray that way? The question is, what happens if I pray that way? Is that the unpardonable sin? No, it's not the unpardonable sin. It just means that it may take longer because you need to be exercising authority. If you be like that will, it's not an exercise of your authority. You need to exercise your authority over the works of the devil, over the works of darkness. You might not believe that um, sickness is of the devil, which means that you won't fight it if you think it's of God. Why do you want to fight God? You don't want to fight anything that is of God. You know, people go to the, go, go to the extent of buying expensive medication. They don't believe that God, they believe that God brought the sickness, but then they pay for very expensive medication and treatment to to push away what God brought. That's not very nice. If, if he's really your God, why do you want to get rid of him? And so I want to encourage you that when you are, when you are reading the scriptures, I want you to understand that you, you, the, the nature of God is, is important to understand the nature of God when you are reading the scriptures when, or when you are dealing for God in, on the earth. You need to understand the nature of God. Is it the nature of God to, to, to destroy a body that he painstakingly sent Jesus to the cross to fix, it's not all right. So it's not the will of God to keep that person in sickness. So it, it has to be the will of God for the person to be healed. And so today, as we continue in, 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 in our study, I want you to see that prayer requires you to understand who you are talking to part time. If you're talking to God, yes, I'm not expecting you to, to, to start tearing God apart, okay? But obviously, if you're talking to the works of the devil, 
oh, you don't you don't take it lightly. You you declare what God has said in the situation. So to, for any kind of prayer to be effective, you need to know what the will of God is. And if you, so if you don't know the will of God, it's very difficult to hold out. You have to just play by air really. And whatever, you, what will be, will be. That's why you have the what will be, will be syndrome. But we, what will be does not have to be if you know what God said. Amen. So someone uh, so answered that question and says, uh, what does um, prayer that avails much mean? Well, it's just an old English way of saying prayer that makes power available. So that's not, there's not much to that. It's just, it's just an old English way of saying um, something that, that is effective or some, something that makes change or something that amounts to much, okay? Um, uh, I've got a question here. How do people manage to pray for long hours? Is it even necessary? It, some people, uh, keep, um, some people keep going a whole night. Like God will not listen to you in a few minutes of prayer. Now, first of all, that person asking that question is assuming that all the prayer that you're making all night is towards God, or is a request from God. You, Jesus, the Bible says in, in Mark chapter 1, verse 35, that Jesus spent all night praying. All night. He did. He would go to the mountain. He would spend all night praying. But I want to believe that it's not because he had needs. It's because prayer includes fellowship. It includes inquiry. It includes a it, it's a communication system. So it includes, it includes you having a, a time of discussion with your father. And so he, he could be spending all night talking about what's going to happen in, in the next 10 cities that he's going to. You know, he's just saying, oh, Lord, give me direction. You know, this is him talking to God about his next uh, assignment. It doesn't mean that he's now begging God, God, please give me close to where, give me food to eat. No, that don't take that much. That doesn't take that long. You can ask God that. And, and if you trust him by faith, you can ask him to lead you into where he's made provision for you. Hallelujah. So it is not about how long the prayer is. Like I always say, it is you that need prayers. It's not God. If God needs prayers, <laughs> then we're all in trouble. Or you need prayers. If you pray, God remains God. If you don't pray, God remains God. If you, if you pray long, God remains God. If you don't pray long, God, God is constant. You're the one that needs help. So no matter how long it takes for you to get your answers, I would say, go for it. But it's not always God that you are talking to. You, God would give you his word concerning the situation. Let's say you are praying about, uh, about admission into university or you want, you, want, uh, you want a new job. And you, you spend time talking to the Lord about it. Say, Lord, I want a new job. And I just want you to speak to me, lead me. You pray in the spirit. That's something that people don't like talking about, praying in the spirit. Well, when Jesus, when Jesus established the, the church in Acts chapter 1, he said to them, don't go anywhere until the Holy Ghost comes. And when the Holy Ghost arrived, the first thing he touched was the tongue of human beings. And so speaking is very important. And I believe that there's another teacher who will deal with that. But your, your ability to speak as a new testament or as a believer whether the new or the old is so vital because that is the way you rule god rules through his word and he expects you also to rule through your words anyway let's go back to this question of the person who thinks praying too long is not necessary it is not necessary if you have seen your change it is necessary if the change hasn't come and you need to put in what you need to do what needs to be done. You may need to, to continue to speak against the situation. You may need to continue to push in the realm of the spirit until the change comes. It doesn't mean that God didn't answer you the first time. It just means that you are dealing with some oppositions. If you are asking whether God needs to be talked to for a long time before he gives you what you ask, 
then the answer is no. God does not need that. The only reason why God has asked you to ask, remember the Bible says he, he knows what we're going to ask. He knows, he before we ask, he already knows. So it's not like he doesn't know what your needs are, but because as as a as the his representative on the earth who must op operate through words, you need to make a request. You need to make a demand on the spirit and you make a demand through words. Jesus said the words that I speak to you, they are spirit. So the only thing that the spirit realm understands is spiritual entities like your words. And so when you speak those words, you are connecting the spirit realm to your situation. And sometimes you may need to hang in there until you see the change. And when I'm saying hang in there, I'm not saying that you're hanging on God because God is all, has already given to you. The, 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 the hanging in there, I mean, is uh, you insist that until you see your change, you're not going to stop the, uh, pushing against the resistance that has come up against you. This happens a lot with, with in terms of your health. When, when symptoms are, 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 are laid there, grips on you as if it's not going to let go but you are saying no i know what the father has said to me he has already said to me that he has healed me and because he has healed me i insist that you cancer must get out and get lost you must leave my body now i will not accept your you to violating my body this body has been paid for by the blood of jesus now that is you taking your ground some people say that's not prayer but i don't know what else that will be if it is not prayer because you are using words to, to which are spirit entities to 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 dislodge what the enemy is doing so i uh, so how long do you have to pray it depends on how long you, you, you need to be there to see the change come. But how long do you need to talk to God? Depends on you. If you love his company, you will, um, if you love his company, you will keep uh, uh, fellowshipping with him and spending time with him. Amen. So this, this, so really what you need to ask yourself is, Am I satisfied with the situation right now? If you are, then you, then you don't need to pray. You can stop. <laughs> and there's no such thing as a vacuum. Life, it does not allow for a vacuum. If you're not, if you're not constantly exercising the realm of the spirit, and, and by that I mean the Holy Spirit, the, the realm of the holy side of the realm of the spirit, then the dark side will, will keep trying to invade and infiltrate your your life and we don't want that hallelujah so thank you for that question somebody asked that question last week okay somebody says oh uh, uh, i'm guilty of saying god is in control and by by confessing this can can we be inviting god into the circumstance or situation versus saying god is in charge of everything which we which we know is not the case or is this truly an unbelieving statement anyway I want to say it is not always an unbelieving statement to say God is in control. It's not always an unbelieving statement, but it's just that it is not true all the time when, when wars are going on and uh, children are dying, COVID-19 is spreading ac across the nations of the earth. And then somebody says to me, that's the act of God. There's no way I'm going to accept that because God is good. The Bible says, in, in James chapter 1 verse 17, all good and perfect gifts come from above, from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither a shadow of turning. And so it cannot be God that is causing that. But we know that the, 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 according to the, uh, Acts chapter 10, 13, the devil was causing sicknesses. And so those all those things like COVID and uh, uh, the uh, coronavirus and the likes of it, they are the works of the devil. And the Bible says in 1 John 3, 8, that this is the reason Jesus was manifested, to destroy the works of the devil. They, those, those expressions of the devil, God is not the one that is in control of those. No, but you have power. You have authority to dislodge them and overpower them and, and remove them from 
existence. Say to me, but yeah, how, how come with all our prayers, COVID has not left? You can imagine. I want you to use your imagination on what it would be like if we were not all praying, if you were not praying. What would it be like? What would be the death rate be like? What would the so-called graphs be like? I guess the graphs would have given up by now. But because the hand of God has been able to curtail it through the prayers of the saints, here we are coming to the end of it. And by the grace of God, I decree the end of COVID-19 in the nations of the earth, in Jesus' name, amen. So thank God, yeah, you can say, you, when you have cast your burden upon the Lord, you can say, Lord, now I say you are in control. You're in charge. You're in charge of my life, amen. Praise God. I'm gonna give some time to some questions right now. Uh, let me see if I've gone through all the questions of last week. Some of them I've answered in my talk. Um, yeah, I think I think I'm okay to take new questions right now. Amen. Okay, thank you very much for Anybody? that. Thank you very much for that, Pastor Agatha. Um, so we'll go, go straight to the first question we've got for today. Why do people say that God has allowed it to happen if he, God, would not have allowed that person to die or to have that illness? Okay. First thing you need to understand is that God allows anything to happen. Quote and unquote. Let me, let me, I'll explain myself. God, the Bible says, it is not the will of God that any man perish, but that all should come, all should be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's God's desire, that everybody will be saved, will come to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and that they will be his children. But not everybody's doing that. Why? Because there's something called the will of man. God started this whole journey by allowing man to have his own free will. Why do you, sometimes, I've, I mean, years ago, I've asked God, why would you give man a will? God said he was trying to create somebody like himself and he has a will. So why would he create somebody that doesn't have a will? If he's creating somebody that will look like him and be in his class and in his own image, then that person would have to have a will because he has a will, right? And so because of the will of man, we, we, we make decisions, and God would have to let you have your decision. For example, when the Israelites were going on about how they want a king, God didn't want them to have a king, at least not in the way they, they were screaming for it. But they were going on and on about it. He hello? God had to work with what they gave him. They said they wanted a king. So he helped them to manage the process. But that wasn't his best for them. So when you say, why do we say God allow? People say that for me, I, I'm careful the way I say it, because it's not as if God consented. Okay. It's just that God is, is, is saying, you, do, you make your choice. You do what you want. And if we do what we want without following what God wants, there, there are consequences that we don't like at the end of such a road. Every action has a consequence. And if our, if our actions don't line up with what God wants, then we need to be ready to face the consequences at the end of that road. Because you're, every time you, 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 choose a, you make a choice, you're also choosing a consequence. So God allows, yes, because you have a will. He's not going to force you against your own will. Sometimes people will pray, God, ah, don't allow me to... God will allow you to do anything that you choose. However, if you then say, Lord, help me to make the right decision. Teach me how to, the, the step to take in this area. Then you are inviting God into your life to enable you to take the right steps. So yes, God allows. God is not the one that is allowing children to die. There are, there are, there's wickedness in the earth. And, it's, and I'm not talking about people, I'm talking about spiritual wickedness that is in the earth, that is, that is vying and fighting for the space in the earth. And so you would have wicked things like children dying, like, like uh, uh, molestation taking place because people have yielded to the spiritual wickedness in the earth. And God didn't introduce the wickedness to the earth. Man did by disobeying him in the first place. So we, 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 need to, we need to just basically go back to God 
I said, God, I'm back home to you. I want you to help me to live the life that you want me to live here on earth. God bless you. Next yes. question, please. Uh, we have quite a lot of questions. Uh, so the next one, <laughs> so the next one is, um, please, I need a little bit more clarification about praying in the New Testament. You said we should make demands and not plead because God has already done, has done it already. But you also mentioned we should pray just the way Jesus said we should using the Lord's prayer pattern. But in the Lord's prayer, we are asking God for his will. Are you, are you referring to the Lord's prayer are you refer and you also you referred to the Lord's Prayer in the last class, so I'm confused now. Is that pattern pattern wrong since it happened before Jesus' death? No, I didn't say the pattern is wrong. If anything, the, the pattern is clarified more in the New Testament. So Jesus said, When you pray, you say, Our Father who art in heaven. So you see that Jesus is saying, always start with acknowledging God always start with making God priority. God already knows the prayer list you are coming with. So don't come to him as if he's just going to be hearing it for the first time. Let him know you care about him and your relationship with him. In fact, because that prayer, that, that prayer we call the Lord's Prayer, because it's a prayer pattern, you can actually just take that first level, the hallowed be thy name, and that's all you do all day. That, that just that kind of prayer where you're just worshiping him all day, you're just acknowledging him, and you're just giving him his place all day long that's a prayer on his own and then another in the in the pattern of praying he then says talk about what's on god's mind let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven so what what's god's plan god whatever it is you want to do on the earth i want to be part of it thy kingdom come let your will be done so that the prayer pattern is good is important but when Jesus introduced us to the New Testament, he added the fact that we have to use his name to be able to achieve it in the New Testament because now he's the one that's connecting us with God. And that is why he said, hitherto you have not asked me anything. You have not asked anything in my name. Up until the time in John chapter 16, Jesus was saying to them that if you need anything, you will come to me. When you need money for to pay your taxes, you came to me. When your when Peter's mother was uh, mother-in-law was sick, he came to Jesus, you know. So Jesus was the one that was more or less connecting them to the father was more or less answering them but now jesus is saying when i'm done my my purpose will be to connect you back to your father so the new testament prayer is enforcing the the will of god or the kingdom of god in the earth what the part of the question i don't understand is the part where um you're saying you're saying something. Can you please read that question again? Sorry. Um, so you, you said we should make demands and not plead because God has done it already. You also mentioned we should pray the way Jesus said we should, using the Lord's Prayer pattern. In the Lord's Prayer, we are we're okay. asking God for his will. Also, you referred to the Lord's Prayer in the last class. So I am confused. Is that pattern okay. wrong since it happened? Okay. In Jesus the Lord's said? Prayer, in the Lord's Prayer, we said your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, so um, that is still a valid prayer till today because we want the will of God to be done on earth. What is the will of God? He wants to save men. He wants he wants um he wants to to pour out his his spirit all over the nations of the earth. He wants the knowledge of his uh, the knowledge of him to fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. He wants to increase our knowledge of even science and and economics. He wants he wants to he wants his wisdom to to run the affairs of the earth through you and me. And so those are the sort of, so when you're saying thy kingdom come, thy will be done, that is not, um, that is not anti uh, what I was teaching earlier and I explained in a minute. So when I said you shouldn't pray thy will be done when you're um, ministering to the sick or you're speaking against the work of, of the enemy, I, I meant that you already know the will of God concerning that situation. So Jesus knew the will of God concerning Peter's mother-in-law. So when he went, when he got to her bedside, he didn't say, Lord, heal her if it be your will or thy will be done. No, he just basically threw the devil out of her body. He just said, fever, leave. And fever left. 
okay so so what i'm trying to explain to you in in those different kinds of prayer is that in in john chapter 14 jesus said that you will make a demand because remember he was talking about the works the greater works he says you will make a demand and that demand will be obeyed in his name because his name is what what ex the authority of his name gives you power over the works of darkness. Luke chapter ten verse nineteen says, "Behold, I give you power and uh, 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 I give you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over the all of the powers of the enemy or all of the authority of the enemy, and not one of them shall by any means harm you." So it's talking about you using your authority. You have authority. Use it. Don't don't beg God that God, please. You remember what happened to Apostle Paul in Second Corinthians chapter twelve. The Bible says I, he had a thorn in the flesh, and he, he he sought the Lord three times. And on those three occasions, the Lord said to him, "What? My grace is sufficient for you. You have what you have the enablement that can handle this situation. And so we we going to God for healing is is like you going to ask God to pay again for what he already paid for. So we go to God for healing in only in the sense that we are saying Lord, we know that you have made healing available in the new covenant and i come in boldly into your presence and i receive that which you have made available thank you for healing me through the uh, death burial and resurrection of our lord jesus christ thank you for paying the price i will not allow sickness to live in my body anymore and then you turn around to the sickness i say hey i have received the word of the Lord. You don't belong to this body. You get out now and I'm not letting you stay. And you spend time speaking to that situation, telling it, you cannot live in my body according to this word, according to that word. Remember when Jesus was, was tempted in the wilderness, what did he always say? It is written. And so according to what is written from my kingdom that I represent, you don't belong to this body. Headaches, migraine, migraine, uh, uh, you know, issues of, of health, you cannot stay in this body because of the word of the Lord. But then somebody will say, yeah, but I've done that for many years and things haven't changed completely. You just need to continue doing it. Just don't stop, keep going for it. And I trust that the more we go at it, the more we gain grounds, amen. I hope that has helped that person. I hope that question has been answered. If that question is not clearly answered, please put it on the chat again. Thank you. Next question, please. Let's see if we can do this. The next question is, when is it time to stop praying about an issue? After having prayed about the matter for a long time, after having prayed about the matter for a long time, I think there's a type of it. So when, when is it okay. time to stop praying about an issue? I'm assuming that that question is, because remember, this is prayer school, and I've told you that the meaning of prayer is communicating is connecting the physical with the spiritual so yeah so if that question is when is it time to stop connecting the spiritual with the physical in this matter then there is no time okay so i'm assuming that the question is when do i stop asking god about the matter right and if that's the case it would have to be the day you asked him so Let's say you've asked him to, you, you said, let's say you're asking for, let's say a husband, okay? You're not married and you want to be married and you're becoming more and more of a mature single, but you believe that God is able to give you a husband. So you, you come and you make your request and say, Lord, I want to be married. And I know that you, you have it available for me. Remember 1 John 5, 14 says that if this is confidence we have, if we pray according to his will, then we know he heard us, okay? So let's say you've prayed according to the will of God and you know that God has made a provision for you. And you, you, you continue to, to thank him that he has made that provision. So what people then do sometimes is that they're thinking, oh, I don't have to ask God anymore. And true, you shouldn't have to ask God for a husband more than once. Why would you need to? He heard you the first time. But your enemies did not hear you the first time. And so it is not God you will be talking to 
in that regard, in that tone of voice anymore. You will now be talking to the opposition. You will now be speaking to the situation, commanding it to change, saying that I have received the promise of the Lord and you will not stop me from uh, receiving a manifestation of that promise. I will not be delayed, neither will I be denied. So all that is prayer. Okay, all that is part of the prayer, but the part where you are still asking God, God, please give me, that has ended. Now you are in the rejoicing mode where God is concerned. When you think about the issue, you say, oh Lord, thank you. Thank you for the provision you have made. You said, when I ask, I will receive. I have asked and I know that I have received because you're not a man that you should lie. And because I know that I have received, I know that you have released for me my provision and therefore anything that is in the way of my provision I take a stand against it in the name of the Lord Jesus. I rebuke it. I decree a free passage for the arrival of my provision in the name of Jesus. Can you see that there's, there is the prayer towards God and there's the prayer towards the situation. So you, you, there is no time. It stops. It only, your, your, the, the entire prayer process, if you want to say stop, it stops, but the entire prayer process does not stop until you have seen your manifestation. Now you might get tired in which case you want to find an avenue where you can pump yourself up again and encourage yourself like David did. The Bible says he encouraged himself in the Lord and then he went, he went after what had been stolen from him. The fact that, that something had been stolen does not mean that you should just roll over and say, oh, maybe that's what God wants. That's not what God wants. It's a thief that came and, and you need to just take spend, spend time in worshiping the Lord like David did and exchange your inability or your weakness for his strength and then go after that which is yours tell the enemy to back out i think i've taken a lot of time on that one any question next question please next question says are you saying you get everything you ask for what happens when you prayed and you didn't get the answer when do you submit to god's will okay i think a lot of a lot of a lot of things have to do with the way we're, we're, we're actually saying them. You know, what, what I mean by that is somebody, that question is already saying, what happens when you have prayed for something and you have not been answered? By who? Who has not answered you? Because the question is, if you believe the scriptures, the scriptures say that you that, that there is a confidence that you can have that when you ask for something that is according to the will of God many times we don't know what is the will of God how do you know the will of God find out what he said if you don't know what he said then and you are asking then you are likely not to be asking according to his will. And if you're not asking according to his will, then don't expect him to answer it. That's number one. But if you have asked according to the will of God, for example, you are a married woman and you're a married, both of you are married and you are you trust the Lord for the fruit of the womb. That is according to the will of God. So at the point of prayer, Jesus said in, 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 in Matthew, Mark 11, verse 24, at the point you make that prayer, receive your answer in the realm of the spirit. You receive it. Hallelujah. And then Jesus said, when you have received it, then you will have it now. So that means that there is a time span between when you, re when you received it and when you have the physical manifestation. That time span might be one second, but it might also be one year. It might be 10 years. But, what, but the, the, you determine how long that time span is. Why? Because it depends on the opposition that has come against the arrival of your of your requests god has given or in when you ask him anything according to his will he gives but he's not the only one operating in the realm of the spirit and that is why you need to be you need to be uh, um constantly um, ready for a fight and say no god has given i'm not letting anybody take it from me and i'm talking about fighting in the realm of the spirit not fighting your physical brothers and sisters the Bible says we do not war against flesh and blood. So we, so basically, 
there's no such thing as oh when you have not received your answer it is it is more of when you have not received the manifestation you have, you have not received a manifestation of what you said you received in prayer for the most part many of us have not even received it in prayer why because we didn't release our faith in prayer and we didn't take it in the place of prayer and so the time span between the manifestation and the prayer gets longer and longer and sometimes you have to revisit your prayer and say maybe i didn't even receive this thing at the point and then continue to study the word of god and find out okay i can even release my faith again go ahead do it again lord i have come about this matter again i release my faith and i receive what you have prepared for me in the name of jesus and i'm out of time oh dear you'll have to bring those questions on for next week amen praise god please continue to send your questions in to us we will collect them for the last day the last day of the meeting which is the 22nd of july it's a it's a pre, uh, it's a question and answer day so the whole hour will be question and answer so let them come in and i hope this question and answer is helping somebody let me pray and then we can go for the day because we don't want to keep you more than we've asked you to heavenly father we thank you for the presence of your mighty holy spirit yes we know that there's not enough time in the world to talk about you every day there's a new facet of your wisdom, of your glory that we can learn. Lord, help us to be humble, to learn more and more from your spirit as he teaches us on this so wonderful subject of prayer. Thank you, Father, that the things that we have learned today, Lord, we will go back, we will check them out. We will check out the scriptures, make sure that Agatha has quoted the right references. And we will hold on to that which is true. We will let go of the ones that we that we feel that is not true or we can't or that we can't place. But we will hold on to the ones that we find that is true. And we know that that which we the, the word of God that we hold on to will set us free. Will make us free in every area of our lives. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you so much for coming to prayer school 102, class two. Hallelujah, you have passed class two and I'll be excited to receive you in class three. Uh, we have a lineup of great teachers coming. So don't miss it. God bless you and see you next week. Bye.